next up, we have a very interesting uh, talk coming up from uh, Daniel Proverbio, who is uh, a doctoral student in the Systems Control Group at the Luxembourg Center for Systems Biomedicine and a visiting doctoral fellow at the University of Exeter. So he has graduated in physics of complex systems and is currently applying quantitative modeling to multidisciplinary complex systems. Among his uh, extra projects, he uh, curates an Instagram channel on scientific information for the broad public. And this was, uh, if I remember correctly, in uh, Italian. So <laughs> if you if you know Italian, uh, you can uh, look it up. Probably tourist Italian doesn't, isn't sufficient. <laughs> Well, even though it's rather for the general public, perhaps you might want to know a little bit more of Italian. That's unfortunate. Yeah, I met uh, Daniela in uh, the uh, International System for uh, Complex Systems, uh, inter International Conference of Com <laughs> for Complex Systems uh, this summer, which was also a great uh, conference by the New England Complex Systems Institute, uh, who you might want to check out um, uh, Janir Bar-Yam and uh, his book, uh, Making Things Work, which is a very readable book, uh, an introduction to uh, complexity. But without further ado, uh, Daniel, uh, tell us about how systems change. Great. Good morning, everybody. I'm just starting to share my screen. Hope you can all see it correctly. Looks good. Perfect. Uh, I was also pretty happy to introduce Matti to Keynote, the great PowerPoint brother of Mac, which we're <laughs> going to use from now on, so you can also give feedbacks on the presentation itself. So good morning again. Uh, it's actually a great pleasure to be here talking. So first and foremost, uh, well, I'd like to thank you, the organizers for the nice invitation. This talk of mine is going to be a little bit more theoretical uh, with respect to the others that we've seen so far, uh, perhaps a little bit closer to the network one, since I'm going to start from a broader theoretical, almost abstract outlook, and then going deeper into explaining how this could be meaningful towards applications in behavioral health in general. The focus of my talk is actually uh, trying to understand and characterize how systems can change the equilibrium state. So what we've seen before, for instance, when uh, people go from one stable state of e.g. depression towards a more healthy, stable state again. So before starting, uh, let me just acknowledge uh, the University of Luxembourg, the research center to which I belong to, which is Luxembourgish Center of Systems Biomedicine, uh, the doctoral training unit critics that provides me, well, of course, fundings, but also a very exciting multidisciplinary environment, and then the University of Exeter and the research group I currently belong to that is led by an engineer but has anyway a great overlook towards more complex and multidisciplinary subjects. So this is basically what I'd like to challenge today. Uh, the popular wisdom that natura non facit saltus, uh, nature doesn't make jumps. This has been passed through generation, I would say, starting from Cartesius, uh, Descartes, uh, Leibniz, all along the various natural philosophers up to recent decades. However, uh, we have many interesting results and knowledge today that actually nature does make jumps. And I'd like to share with you uh, what could be the leading mechanisms that we've known uh, so far and how those could inform us from theory to practice. Let's get started with a practical example. Uh, unfortunately, we couldn't meet in person, so I couldn't put this in my luggage. I'm just showing it here. Uh, this is a so-called catastrophe machine uh, concept and conceptualized by Zeman already in the 70s. It's basically just a board with a wheel that is pivoted and that you can govern just by stretching the various elastics. So here is what you would describe as uh, a smooth behavior. 
So you just turn the wheel almost the same way as most gears in mechanical engines do, and nothing particularly fancy is showing off. However, if, for instance, you change the angle at which you pull the elastics, this is what happens. So no matter how hard you pull it, nothing changes. It remains in a certain equilibrium until you reach a tipping point, a specific threshold in your pulling that makes the machine tips abruptly. So it goes from one stable equilibrium into another one almost immediately. And actually, this is the fault of the video, but you could actually see that the tipping actually happens when my finger goes outside of this diamond-shaped uh, well, shape. So pretty importantly, this uh, can be actually studied by means of time series, of course. In red, you can see the time series that uh, the smooth transition would display. So we have an equilibrium and then we go towards next one, but some sort of uh, in a smooth fashion. On the other hand, in blue, you can actually see time series of something that is tipping. So you stay around your equilibrium. Uh, apparently nothing is really changing, but at a certain point when you pull the, the, the elastic um, strongly enough, you have your machine that tips incredibly fast onto a brand new equilibrium. Now, what I'm focusing on, particularly in, in my research and in this talk, of course, is what happens next to this abrupt shift that we might also call a critical transition. So why those critical transitions were actually studied and why it's possible to already transfer some knowledge onto this field? Well, because during the recent years, they've been characterized and studied in different other um, subjects. For instance, ecology, uh, climatology, some hypotheses that we are still uh, validating and testing in our lab about what happens in biology. For instance, when cells differentiate, you go from a stem cell towards a neural cell. Uh, can this be described as uh, a critical transition or not? Those are very exciting questions. But what's particularly interesting for this specific uh, audience is that many hypotheses, as, as we've seen so far during uh, this symposium, address the question, do we actually see these shifts in mood disorders? So uh, I'm gonna be slightly more mathematical. Uh, there's no many questions involved, but just to get you the feeling how it's possible actually to go from just abstract metaphors onto some much more detailed modeling. So first things first, we have to model what's going on in our behavioral changes as a dynamical system. So it is characterized by state variables that are basically shaping some state space. So all the possible configurations that our system can access to. Uh, we have a bunch of parameters, uh, like control parameters. So something that is able to actually modify and mold the, the state space. We can think, for instance, of uh, external perturbances such as drugs or stuff like this that actually is able to change our internal state. And then, of course, we have uh, a bit of noise, meaning all those very rapid and not so big processes that are actually not pertaining to the, to the main dynamics. It's just some small fluctuations that can happen at time scale that are, are pretty, pretty fast and they just relax afterwards. So, uh, Considering how systems change their state means looking how those systems live an extractor state in which they are living. So the specific subset of the state space that it's much more favorable for your system to recede in uh, because of dynamical constraints that can be feedbacks um, or, or any other kind of um, dynamics. And then move on to another one. Well, in principle, you would need 
lots of data, lots of dimensions to describe the whole system. But uh, interestingly enough, it's often possible just to look at the main direction to which your system would move. I mean, it's very unlikely that your system would go from A to B by following this kind of a trajectory. They will probably go straight ahead. This can be mathematically formalized. There's a whole theory about this, uh, but conceptually speaking, this corresponds just to make uh, a cut, like basically considering only the leading eigen direction from one attractor to another. And this will basically lead us to the metaphor that Matty was uh, using before, that of attractor uh, landscapes uh, that are characterized by those valleys that are just, you know, the uh, 2D visualization of the uh, full attractor space. Your system can be visualized as some sort of a ball that actually wiggles inside the tractor doing nothing much, just small changes. But at a certain point, when this equilibrium gets destabilized, your system would tip onto another attractor. This is one of the main uh, mechanisms for which you can have critical transitions. Of course, there are others. So let's get started with some uh, coarse grain classification of the possible transitions that we can observe in real systems. Of course, we have the class of continuous transitions. We're not 100% um, interested in that during this talk, but those are basically the ones that we can almost perfectly piecewise linearize when studying their dynamics. On the other hand, we have the whole cluster of critical transitions. There are those, of course, for which you are actually required to know the full network or the high dimension of your systems, and you cannot do much about them. But we also have many, many examples of those transitions where you can actually lump your, your parameters, your variables, and just consider um, the main direction in low dimensions that I was mentioning before. Among those, uh, we can recognize those that are um, induced by bifurcation or by noise. And I will, of course, talk a little bit more in detail in the next slides. Of course, in the mathematical literature, there are other examples, but so far they've not been um, actually assessed in real world systems. So I'm gonna concentrate just on, on those two. Bifurcation induced, what are they? Well, they're actually connected to the example that I showed you before. You have your state space, your system is happily living in one of the attractor states, uh, that's its equilibrium, it's not going further from it. Let's imagine you're in a healthy state, no matter if you're slightly more happy, less more happy, whatever, uh, day by day, you're overall in your healthy state. But then something, which is uh, modeled as a control parameter, actually start changing and modifying uh, the resilience of your state space slowly but steadily. Let's imagine you actually see, I don't know, some accidents um, day by day. At a certain point, there is a critical point, a tipping value, for which your system gets completely destabilized. So it's not any more resilient to external uh, perturbations and therefore it jumps onto a brand new state. Here we can see it more dynamically. So uh, as the parameter changes, you have your landscape that gets modified. And this refers to the metaphor of the straw that breaks the camel's back. So you didn't actually understood that something was going on just because your overall equilibrium was not changed. It was what's beneath that was stressed and stressed and stressed until you get to the critical point that makes your, uh, your system change uh, stability. This also exhibits uh, hysteresis. This is a particularly interesting phenomenon. Uh, it refers to the fact that for going to some specific equilibrium onto another one and to get back, you will actually need to hit different threshold values for your parameters. 
uh, this might also ring a bell in a way that uh, most of traumas cannot actually be just solved with a equal but uh, inverse um, trauma, like uh, the joke about uh, hitting someone with a baseball bat. That it's it's not a simplification for cartoons, and this might uh, lead our intuition towards understanding what could be going on. The other big class is that of noise-induced critical transitions. In this case, your system gets just uh, slightly destabilized, but you have external perturbations that are high enough uh, to kick you out of your equilibrium onto another stable state. This also exhibits hysteresis, as we've seen previously uh, from Matti, in a way that if your landscape is somehow already um, Asymmetric, of course, the, the strength of the noise to get you from the rightmost equilibrium to the leftmost is actually different from going the other way around. There are mathematical methods that can be used to assess and quantify this, such as the mean transient time uh, for stochastic processes, actually trying to get from those abstract measures onto something real that uses data is uh, one of the works in progress that we are facing. So you might say, okay, fine, uh, this is an abstract um, general framework, but how can we profit from it? Well, interestingly enough, during the last years, people have started studying generic statistical indicators uh, that could act as early warning signals to detect and alert, um, most importantly, the bifurcation-induced critical transitions. For the noise ones, work is a little bit uh, lagging behind, but it's still in progress. So what happens is basically that uh, we have observed that when you're approaching the tipping point, there are some statistical indications such as the correlation variance, uh, some ideas also about uh, entropy measures and so on, that change into va the, their value. And this is actually generic for all the possible uh, systems that no matter the mechanistic underlying model exhibit very similar dynamics. So this also kind of bridges, how can we go from, uh, let's say, um, uh, a single person perspective onto a broader population. So, I get, whoops, sorry. So here it's definitely possible to study those critical transitions without relying to specific mechanistic models and to go towards system classification. So using those kind of measures to try to understand if you're next to um, bifurcation or noise, and also to try to detect the sensitive regime that we're facing. Of course, their performance might vary depending on the specific dynamical uh, properties and context that your system is facing. But in general, we can already try to understand which ones are more robust, which one can give us much more information, and overall, how can we depict a broader picture onto some more quantitative studies towards data analysis. Just to wrap up, here's actually finally, what's the relevance of those indicators for behavioral sciences? I'm sorry, this is pretty annoying. I wanna just silence this stuff. Uh, okay, fine. Okay, um, since this is the kind of data that you can observe in, uh, in behavioral sciences, you might actually wonder if those things can be described as critical transitions. First, because you want to understand which are the key drivers of behavioral change. Are they actually mostly driven by continuous changes that don't exhibit hysteresis, or there are actually critical transitions? And then what is leading them? Are they random forces for which we don't have much control upon, or are there actually some underlying control mechanisms that we can ex eventually exploit not only for understanding beyond, of course, the linear approximation, but also to help practitioners 
for instance, to identify the sensitive phases in case they are unwanted, to try to revert them back in case they are um, good uh, transitions, for instance, from depression to, to healthy state, to try to, to push the system even further so that we can actually uh, help the patients uh, much more uh, in a much more personalized manner. So I'm just getting to the end, uh, just to wrap up. I just like to recall that actually nature can make jumps. This is uh, pretty important to remember to go beyond what's been uh, modeled so far that might be limited. Uh, by using such framework, it's actually possible uh, to inquire those critical transitions without knowing the underlying mechanistic models. We can sit uh, on a much macro scale level sort of similarly to studying temperature rather than the single movement of molecules uh, that are basically uh, tackled by statistical mechanics for you that have those knowledge from physics. Uh, of course, there are different ways to reach those critical transitions and we're uh, in a way of completing the classification and looking for the different measures that can happen into those different classes. And then, of course, the final goal would be to improve the performance of such indicator indicators. All of this, once said theoretically, might eventually guide us towards better applications and towards better personalized interventions for the health of uh, different patients. Of course, everything here has to be viewed under the lens of complex systems, and therefore, uh, this is why, basically, I got invited here. Hope this was uh, clear and I'm now open for any of your questions. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, that was really exciting. The idea of um, focusing rather on the temperature um, than on uh, individual atoms Mm, I feel that it has a really good, uh, good driving power for uh, like shifting our mindset into what are we actually, what do we want to uh, figure out? So, or um, what are the important parts in, uh, in the system? So how do you actually study the um, control parameters or the equivalent of a temperature and uh, figure out what, what is the um, control parameter in a system? Yeah, this is crucial. I mean, possibly uh, just by focusing on this macro scale, um, I mean, this is slightly more phenomenological, of course. So you are mostly considering how things works rather than what makes them uh, change. This can be practically applicable for a number of, uh, of things. But then, of course, at a certain point, you will want to know what are the drivers. This is actually where such uh, complex system, holistic view, and a more reductionist point of view would eventually need to merge together. I mean, they're not one or the other they must be one and the other because they are just uh, giving us different lenses to consider our mechanisms. Uh, again, uh, I can use a metaphor from, from physics and engineering. Uh, at the very beginning of the 18th century, nobody knew what temperature actually was. They were just measuring it. But nonetheless, they made some engines. Eventually, thanks to statistical physics, they understood what made the engines work. And so they managed to improve it way better. I think this could be also something that we might experience now. So starting from understanding fully what's going on and at a certain time connecting with those that are studying the underlying mechanisms. Because the problem here is that in principle, unless you have just a couple of control parameters that are pretty obvious, uh, like in our case, we are studying cells and you are basically just treating them with um, man-made drugs. So you know that that drug is your control parameter. If you're giving a person some antidepressives, that could be your control parameter as well. 
but of course there could also be other underlying mechanisms uh, that could be, I don't know, uh, fluxes of magnesium or potassium inside your brain, for instance, GABAergic uh, uh, hormones and so on and so forth. Uh, but there could also be different combinations. And understanding exactly which combination to which power is actually your exact control parameter, this is most probably the next big, huge challenge of this uh, particular research field. Because we already know some ideas about how can you make together networks so that you end up with something low dimensional. Uh, we have already some ideas about the fact that some things intuitively can be more important than others, but, you know, pinpointing exactly the cause that can be a combination of different physiological causes, exciting times are waiting us ahead. Uh, we have a raised hand. Um, uh, can someone, uh, Sarmit or me, to uh, help? Esa Pekka Takala, ask the question. Hi, thank you for uh, your nice presentation. My question is about uh, that you have shown that you can identify jumps or critical changes in, uh, in uh, de collected data. And, uh, I would like to ask you that, uh, do you know if somebody have gone further in some behavioral studies so that uh, uh, you make a theoretical model and have theoretical different interacting factors and give different weights for those about the dynamics of those and after that making simulations uh, and there uh, because that kind of simulation should could be one way to see that if those uh, phenomena that appear by simulations seem looks like the natural changes. Absolutely. Uh, the field in general is more or less at its infancy, but here there are a few references uh, also from uh, Merlin Althoff that Matthew already mentioned and Matt himself that are actually already trying to uh, follow this kind, uh, this kind of ideas. Other references, I know of one from Stappelberg's group from Australia and from Martin Schaeffer uh, in the Netherlands that are uh, already trying to, um, to perform what you, what you suggested. So devising some toy model that can somehow make sense and reproduce the, the natural dynamics, uh, then making simulations and start um, try and start identifying such indicators there. Uh, apart from those, I'm not really sure that many works have been done in this specific direction because it's pretty brand new in a way. Thank you. Okay. I can probably also put the references in the Slack channel. Uh, that would be helpful. Yes, there is a uh, Slack channel for critical transitions or what this was called, uh, something like this. <clears throat> and uh, in the chat box, uh, you also, Merlin Althoff, um, has been doing the work on um, destabilization in uh, per, uh, mood disorders that you see on the slides on the screen. He just put on the uh, chat box uh, a link to a preprint of a uh, computational model that might be related to this question also. Yeah. Thank you, Mati Merlin, for sharing. <clears throat> 